Hi, good evening. Um, welcome to DIA Artists on Artists Talk. My name is Jasmine Raymond, and I'm DIA's curator. And um, I would like to begin by thanking SEA Foundation and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their support of this program. And I'd like to thank Christine Poor, Patrick Hellman, and Ashley Tico for their help coordinating this um, lecture. It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Louis Kamnister. Louis Kamnister's prolific career, which spans over 40 years, has been fueled by an enduring commitment to work to work, to make work, and to think about protest, mourning, and protestation, to borrow a term that the philosopher, the late philosopher Sarah Kaufman will, will talk about, this idea of protestation, of not just only protesting, but ex doing it in many different ways. He was born in, Ger in Germany in 1937, but Early on, his family emigrated when he was still an infant to Uruguay, and that's where he grew up and studied in the School of um, Fine Arts at the University of Uruguay, and then later on went to study printmaking uh, in Munich Art Academy. 1964, he comes to New York, and together, two years later, together with the artist Liliana Porter, who's with us tonight, thank you for coming, and the late um, Jose Guillermo Castillo, they produced work under the collective name, the New York Graphic Workshop, for about five years. And during this uh, collective group, they sent out a, an offensive type of um, attack to the conventions of printmaking and those orthodoxies by mounting what were known at that time as they called the male exhibitions. And this um, was something really radical and forever changed what we understand as interventions with printmaking and, and printed um, on limited editions and so on in the, in the spirit of fluxes and, and some other movements. Kamnister has not um, made things easy for himself. In his effort to allow the political and the ethical to enter his art, he has worn many hats including being an essayist, a writer, critic, a curator, and a very influential professor at the University of New York College of Old Westbury. His work has been widely exhibited internationally, has previously had ex solo exhibitions at the Kitchen, El Museo del Barrio, Liz Visual Arts Center, MIT, Museo Carrillo Hill in Mexico City. Retrospectives of his work has been presented at Lehman College of Art Gallery in the Bronx in 1991, at the Kunsthalle at Kiel in 2003, and this year the Daros Collection is organizing a retrospective of his work. From 1999 until 2006, he served as the viewing program curator at the Drawing Center, and in 2007, he was the pedagogical curator for the sixth biennial of Mercosur. He's at the present the pedagogical curator of the Iberic Camago Foundation in Porto Alegre and the collection Cisneros in New York. He's the author of numerous books, including The New Art of Cuba, on art, artists, Latin America, and other utopias, conceptualism in Latin America art, Latin American art, excuse me, didactics of liberation, and was co-curator with Jane Farber and Rachel Wise of the seminal exhibition Global Conceptualism, Points of Origins, that was at the Queens Museum in 1999. So please help me uh, welcome Luis Carnister tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. You just reminded me that I'm old. <laughs> so this is Palermo and non-declarative art. Uh, one question that always intrigued me is how far can one go in removing declarations from art, clear expressions of the artist's voice, without fully losing the awareness that it is art? Coupled with that question come many others. For example, how complex can art be without expressing complexity or forcing the perception of complexity on the viewer? Is it possible to get the work of art act like a cosmic black hole that is absorb information rather than emit it? Wouldn't an apparent stupidity or deceptive dumbness be more effective to the scent than high and visible sophistication? 
These are issues that on and off, together with the concern for the elimination of the erosion of information and communication through art, have preoccupied me since the 1960s. The issue of erosion of information in the process of communication, the need for resolution and redundancy to maintain pristine communication, has been one of the primary concerns of conceptualist strategies and has defined them. The issue of withholding information to elicit the efforts of the recipient has been a less defined issue in the arts. Since most of the works in art history are focused on some kind of a message, program, or speculation, the question of this relative absence of information is not often present and therefore not easy to exemplify. Minimalism, which might be used as an example, was really concerned with formal purity and not with communication. Nevertheless, in recent art history, I feel some works did address these issues. They may reflect my own projections and wishful thinking, or they may have objective qualities. Who knows? I choose here Lucio Fontana's Conceptos Espaciales of 1959 and 1960, and his Ambientes Espaciales Watercolors of 1948. The first are big patinier bronze balls. They seem meaningless, but manage to evoke the power of dolmens. The second have a tantric quality that foreshadows some of Palermo's work two decades later, particularly that triangle, which I want to underline for this presentation. Then I would choose Elioiti Sica, Bolides, of uh, 1964, where materials establish some kind of, sorry. <sighs> Doesn't want to stay. Okay. <laughs> where materials establish some kind of untranslatable poetic relations. Sant'Antonin, who made Cosas, that is, Sinks, in 1961, are probably examples of the most conscious approach here, though visually contaminated by European informalism by, of the type of mijares that made, were made some time earlier. But Sant Antonin tried to get to the essence of thingness, ruling everything else out, even by naming them thing. And later, the objects themselves, when he burns the production of his lifetime. Some pieces by Richard Tuttle, the smallest and subtler ones, seem to approach the problems from the point of view of selection and editing, added to his very particular touch. And the pieces that interest me here, like Oitisica and his Bolides, Tuttle finds things and barely tweaks them, mixing the idea of ready-made with that of lightest touch. Archwager's BLP, I don't know how he would pronounce them, of 1969, a shape inspired by the radar screen signal on military submarines, may serve as another example. I would also put his furniture of the mid-60s close to this kind of art. In the case of the BLP, it was a ubiquity that may have worked against what I'm looking for. Archwager puts his image all over the place and transforms them into personal signature. This introduced some kind of declaration into the work, like, according to Castelli, his then gallerist, Kilroy, was here. Somewhat related to the Beal piece is Palermo's triangle over the door. Also from 1969. BLPs is a form of personal punctuation, ultimately inspired by typography. Palermo's triangle re-signifies an objective form, one that because of overexposure is practically invisible. The artist asks the viewer to reconsider it and to fill it with importance. I never before had thought about connecting Archwager with Palermo, and I'm quite surprised there is a link but the connection becomes stronger the more I think about it. 
It's not only the formal relation of the BLP with some of Palermo shapes, or the positioning of BLP with the positioning of the triangle over the doors of his friends. The relation extends to the awkward presence in Artwagger's furniture that is shared with Palermo's way of composing or decomposing geometrical work. Both refuse to cater to our expectations. They present us with a misleading situation and put us in a loop of recommencing our viewing and reactions. All these works, <coughs> including the other examples I mentioned, are visually simple and yet derive strengths from their resistance to any simple explanation. They are rational on the surface, but imbued with a profound consistency. They seem hermetic, but they inspire the viewer to draw closer rather than reject them. They avoid any feeling of flair or slickness, offering a muted dullness instead. The works reveal themselves as part of a complex and coherent universe that suddenly and unexpectedly lights up once they are broached by the viewer's effort. No matter what their physical appearance, ranging from obnoxious presence to a serial levity, there are pieces that transcend objecthood and become a space offered by the artist so that the viewer starts a process of creation unhampered by information. Well, at least I think so. I saw Palermo's work for the first time in 1971 in the gallery Heiner Friedrich had in Cologne. It was an exhibition of drawings shared with Baselitz and probably some other artists who I don't remember now. I was not impressed. Baselitz seemed gimmicky and facile, and his work did not predispose me to appreciate the rest of the show. Maybe as a consequence, I dismissed Palermo's work on the spot. I pegged his drawings as an easy offspring of US minimalism, a movement that at that time I saw as a pseudo-mystical research into corporative logotype making. Maybe this was a little extreme on my part and possibly even a rash judgment when extended to all of minimalism. My opinion certainly was tainted by some political ideas I had at the time. Today, I'm neither ashamed nor completely recovered, but at least I can see myself more objectively, and the old and rabbit stance was very useful in as much as it helped me hone my own conceptualist explorations. Nevertheless, I recognize that in the case of Palermo, all this had blinded me. About three decades later, actually prodded by my son, I radically revised my views about his work. It was the green triangle that my son pointed out to me that did it. That triangle, which will come on the screen a little later, made me put Palermo in the context I'm discussing now with due importance. The pieces of all the artists I mentioned are examples of the anti-spectacle. They definitely state their presence but they also minimize it. While these artworks have little to do with pointlessness and emptiness, the artists do make significantly different decisions than those one usually expects from an art exhibition. Where an intelligent art decision would normally be made, these artists intelligently choose to go in a different direction, one that leaves definitions open to ensure room for the viewer. All this is rather difficult to explain, partly because explanation is probably the one topic most carefully erased from these works. That is why, when addressing this kind of work, I feel compelled to resort to the use of words like stupidity and dumbness, although this is meant in an unexpectedly positive interpretation. Often I add the word deceptively, trying to underline my good intentions. There is a good word in Spanish, boludo, literally intended to mean weighed down by one's balls. That captures the concept in a much better way. But there is no good translation for it in English. The Oxford Dictionary registers it as dickhead. But I believe the closest interpretation might be dumbass. In English, I therefore tend to speak of dumbass art 
still with the natural obstacles I encounter to make this sound like a compliment. Some years ago, while groping with this language problem, I tried to explain to Sally Titman that her work wasn't yet stupid enough. Again. Okay. Sally, a US artist whose work I was seeing at the drawing center, and who, to my surprise, understood me very well, then told me about St. Thomas Aquinas. During the year St. Thomas was studying in the seminary, his classmates called him Dumb Ox. He was rather heavy set and taciturn and moved slowly. His classmates were unable to figure out exactly what and how much he was thinking. He was embodiment of that Spanish word, boludo. The word, in fact, conjures the dumb ox image, but it does so in a way that underlines the quality of opaqueness, muteness, and reluctance to give an expressive message. A boludo, therefore, can either easily be dismissed as stupid and close to its loss, or becomes a beneficiary of rich interpretations. In the case of Aquinas, only his teacher, Albertus Magnus, recognized this quality and the full force of his student's character, long time before Aquinas produced anything understandable for his classmates and for posterity. The opposite phenomen, phenomen, <coughs> phenomenon is also possible. The situation of complete projection by the viewer is portrayed by Jerzy Kosinski's prophetic novel, Being There. The main character in, its, in it is Chance, a gardener to become Chauncey Gardiner, who does nothing beyond uttering ambiguous non-declarative statements and then reaches the US presidency thanks to the projection powers of his accidental and powerful listeners. From the outside, Gardiner is a counterpart to the early Aquinas. <clears throat> as both are inexpressive and can't be read, but read into. Both hid behind some silence and much ambiguity. Gardiner because he didn't know better, Aquinas because he did know better. However, as opposed to the early Aquinas, whatever profundity chance might have had existed only in the mind of the wishful thinking of his audience. Aquinas can be taken as a paradigm for art. Gardiner became a political paradigm. As added trivia and by sheer coincidence, today's New York Times quotes Susilo Bambang Yudoyono the president of Indonesia, who just released a new CD of his music. I quote, they said SBY is lazy, big, and stupid like a buffalo. The article also notes that the authorities immediately banned water buffaloes from further public demonstrations. So not quite acceptable and respectable art speak, I believe Damas or Boludo are good terms to describe the work of artists who are intelligently exploring the non-emission or minimization of information. This, I want to stress again, has nothing to do with minimalism or with reductionism. In this context, declarative art can be defined as work that serves to inform the viewer about the artist. The viewer is expected to seek out the artist's voice and to listen to his or her opinion. The opinion may be content-oriented or may be making a statement about form and order. Instead, the artists fitting the dumbass concept seek certain dullness in resonance, a muffled quality, and lack of explicitness. The works don't cut off communication, but rather change the direction to put the onus on the viewer. All this, in fact, is not a matter of burdening, but empowering the viewer. Misinterpretation becomes irrelevant as the viewer consciously realizes that the work is meant to be read in multiple ways. 
both this reversal of the flow of information and elimination of dictation gently leads the viewer to become the creator of indefinite and not preordained meaning. What these artists share is their deviation from predictable decisions. The monologue as traditionally expressed is absent. Shapes and position of shapes seem purposefully awkward and even clumsy, and the participation of the viewer takes the place of any declaration by the artist. The artist offers their guiding quasi-silence. There is definitely no monologue, and if there is any dialogue, it is between the viewers and their echoes. In the ensuing silence, imagination has a space to take over. The responsibility of the creative effort is transferred from the artist to the public, and the usual passive and static activity of consuming becomes meaningless. By utilizing contradictions and by doing so strategically, the artists provide parameters to ensure a desired range of reading and projection. Thus, they bring their work back to being a truly cultural project. In a push for democratization, for sharing the creative impulse rather than a given result, ownership of power is radically shifted. And yet, the artists do not give up the power of conversion normally expected of them. They only give up the self-aggrandizing power of declaration. I believe that may be enough to start a social project that meaningfully transcends the mere fabrication of art by being unimposing and promoting humility in a way a socialism of creativity. I did not finish, I just want to drink. Surprisingly, <clears throat> even the grand scale of Palermo's installation to the people of New York City maintains an atmo atmosphere of humbleness. While the community of color some, somewhat holds this stuff together, giving a feeling of coherence, there is nothing else present to accomplish this. No order, no sequence or graspable echoes, only an elusive hand that dissolves as soon one tries to grasp it. Ultimately, it is a coherence of incoherence that can continue growing infinitely while remaining unprepossessing. This quality of elusiveness may explain why all the texts written about Palermo have so many different takes on his work and allow writers to talk about their own ideas rather than about him. This, of course, includes me as well. It is puzzling how in this lack of agreement there still is a consensus about Palermo's importance, and yet nobody can put their finger on why. Many words are used to explain Palermo. I can say that in reading them, I've improved my English. Some of the words which blew my mind and intrigued me most were relationality, logicality, and purposive. purposive. Incredibly, we're all in the same paragraph. Most discussions focus on how Palermo separated the painting from the wall, discuss if its premises were related to conceptual installation or to the purity of painting, and speak of how he painted on aluminum, actually a regret regrettable decision from the conservation point of view, or mention other anecdotal information. His teacher, Boyce, would only advance civil and remarks about Palermo's porosity or his being a breath and concur with his interviewer that the image of despair of a cornflower was the best way to describe him. Palermo is treated as a full-fledged artist who knew all along what he was doing. Nobody seems to grant him the human space a very good inquisitive student might have or the right to go in many directions some of them good and even exceptional, and some less interesting. Given his premature death and lack of written material, any interpretation seems to go. On the other hand, the real importance somehow remains untouched. 
I was surprised that in the aftermath of Tuttle's retrospective, Robert Storr was the only US writer to pick up on something that seemed obvious, the correspondence between Richard Tuttle's work and that of Palermo. However, when critics write about Palermo in this country, his work is often related to that of Tuttle. Yet nobody really pinpoints what might make Palermo an artist of relevance. It seems to be a given, but an unexplained given. If I were a school teacher and all those writers were sitting in my class, that is a topic I would force them to write about. When one says Palermo, or the name of any other artist, its implication is that references only pertain to the signature works, since nobody is consistent throughout the lifespan of a career. Given both his short life and his obvious curiosity, in Palermo's case, referencing is even spottier, and different people define different works as signature pieces. That may be one of the explanations for the diversity of, mis of interpretations. Palermo's interest in color and the recurrence of some shapes may help create some formalist associations, while any deviations from them lend themselves to other theories. Mostly, however, writers extol modest contributions to the art repertoire and avoid any attempt to figure out if there is any more fundamental contribution to knowledge at large. And Rorimer, in her Art Forum essay about Palermo, quotes Boyce. Boyce, obviously thinking about himself, said, making art is a means for working for man in the area of thought. The statement implies the presence of some kind of a discourse. In describing Palermo's work, the possibility of a discourse seems to be reduced to the different formal appearances and formal context in which his objects take form. While it is true that most of Palermo's work has a serious art presence, whatever that means, I think that the more interesting pieces go beyond that, and that is what makes them more relevant. The same as everybody else, I will pick the works that are convenient for my own series, and fortunately for Dia's investment in this talk, my choices include the To the People series. Here is another view. Emmy <clears throat> Knörbel, who made 24 colors, an homage to Palermo upon his death, in certain ways, is a perfect counterpart to Palermo's To the People. It is notable that it seems to capture Palermo much more accurately than any of the published writings describing him. But maybe I should limit the statement to individual pieces of Nürbel's installation and not to the whole thing. Nürbel didn't really need a mega installation to portray Palermo. Any single piece would have done. The problem of the installation is that with its ambitious size and outlook, it dismisses Palermo's very important quality of modesty. With this work, Knobel faced a conundrum. Had he restricted himself to one single painting, he would have failed to reach the aspired memorial quality. That mausoleum equivalent Knobel needed to celebrate his friend. The homage also would have lost the personal statement Knobel probably wanted to add while doing this. This was the first occasion in which he used colors. It was the opening of a pass of research hitherto close to him. During their friendship, it was Palermo who owned color, and the respect for Knurbel stuck to the natural color of materials or with basic monochromatic applications. It looks like Palermo's death allowed him to take over this mantle and with it produce a one-time masterpiece. But then again, Knurbel's memorial and Knurbel's eruption into color are declarations, and so is a, a mausoleum-like action, regardless of the result. Knobel's project, impressive as it is, was condemned to remain an oxymoron. When I was 13 years old, a math teacher spoke to my class about rational geometry. I don't think I heard the term again, 
nor could I find it in English in those terms. I even tried Wolfram Alpha, the new computational knowledge search engine. There I only got Wolfram Alpha isn't sure how to compute an answer from your input. From what I remember, however, this rational geometry dealt with an idealized geometry that allowed us to look at clumsy representations of shapes and to draw mathematical conclusions from them in spite of their imprecision. Something Greek, it was a way of dematerializing geometri geometrical images. The visual body of dots, lines, surfaces, and polygons could be ignored for the benefit of pure thought. There was something of a very appealing transmutation in the procedure. It was a downgrade of the visible object to the level of a step in a ladder that allowed going beyond itself to reach things higher up. This, of course, may also be one of the fundamentally important functions of art but it is often obscured by the fetishism our society imposes on the art object. Because of this fetishism, we forget that a ladder is there to climb it. Instead, we're forced to doggedly look at the artifact as if it were the end station. The works of Palermo that grab me have the quality of this rational geometry. It is thanks to him that I again remembered the term, and it is no accident that one of my favorite pieces is my already announced, and now finally on the screen, Green Triangle, from 1970, part of his four prototypes. It is a really dumb and imperfect Green Triangle. The piece also brings to the fore the mismatch between Knoebel's piece and Palermo's work. While in its own modest way, the Green Triangle seems to contain or at least is capable of making me project an enormously complex configuration, Knoebel's piece, like most mausoleums, has an illustrative function and force. We look through and past Palermo's piece while we look at Knoebel's piece. Now, to be fair, the obvious comparison would not be 24 colors with the green triangle, but with to the people since both are comprised of multiple paintings occupying a big room. Knoebel's installation uses 24 colors in the place of all colors. 24 in this case, the same as in the TV series, is the equivalent of infinity. And for Knoebel, this is a simple and valid equation, but also a close case with an ending punctuated by the one piece with several overlapping shapes. Infinity is implied, but not presented. In To the People of New York, Palermo uses only three colors. There is no sequence, no echoes or mirrored images, only hints at non-existing orders. Infinity is in the air, defined by the labyrinths the viewer builds trying to build the order. Maybe this is what Boyce understood with his word porosity applied to Palermo. But he could have had the courtesy of telling us so. I must confess that when I started to write about Boludo or Damas art five years ago, I did so tongue in cheek. Boludo is mostly used as an insult in the southern corner of Latin America. I wrote a presentation for Buenos Aires, and I thought it might be funny to give a talk that sounded relatively erudite around a word nobody would take seriously, even if I did this for convenient expediency. I fell into my own trap. The theory started to take off in my mind, and my tongue returned to its normal place. At some point, I feared that I might be deriving from Humberto Eco's The Open Work, and to some extent, this might be true, since when published in 1962, it became a seminal book for my generation. However, the aesthetics that informed Eco's book were art informel and other art, and he cites as his examples Dubuffet, Fautrier, Mathieu, as well as Berion, Stockhausen, and music, all dated in the late 50s. 
Echo dealt with the multiplicity of meanings and interpretations, but did not focus on the production of icons that simultaneously might be informationally synthetic, high density, and ambiguous. An aesthetic sign, according to Echo, cannot be interpreted simply as referential. Its meaning has a global quality of connectedness. The aesthetic sign denotes vaguely and only can be perceived as ambiguous. While all of, this, all of this applies here to what I'm talking about, when discussing these issues, ECHO focuses more on the reading part than on the creative processes. Openness for him is equivalent to incompleteness, requiring that the viewer or the interpreter fill in the blanks, or to put it differently, finishes the game the artist started. It is a work as long as it is perceived as such. If it were totally open, the viewer would be confronted with white noise, an undifferentiated mixture of all frequencies. Echo, however, did not address attempts to eliminate the erosion of information in the transmission of art or the use of an absence of declaration to generate creativity in the viewer. This first informed much of the work produced under the different conceptualisms around the world in a search for immediate and efficient communication. The second is what I refer to as dhammas art, works that deny their presence without reaching non-existence, works that operate on the borderline between imbecility and invisibility, but without being either. Imbecility, a word unlike retarded, that I hope will not ever become politically incorrect, implies absence of intelligent order, where declaration still is one of its manifestations. Invisibility, well, I don't think I should explain it. The thing is that once a work of art states or shows that it is a work of art, it is already declarative and therefore in danger of losing its dumbass quality. Commenting on Morandi's painting, Liliana Porter, an artist who shared with me all these concerns during the 1960s, summed it up with, successful boludo art achieves a silence of such perfection that under utopian conditions, we would be able to listen to it. Boludo would be the space of, quote, the contrary. One might be tempted to use tautology to achieve all this. It would seem that non-declaration can be achieved by enclosing the work in itself, by eliminating all non-artistic references and let the work be only what it is. Referring to its own work, to his own work, Frank Stella once sums this up with what you see is what you see. Implicitly, this idea tried to eliminate the erosion of information and therefore had some interest for subsequent conceptual approaches in art. In effect, though, in this process of formalist reduction, typical in Stella's early black stripe paintings, the work runs the risk of becoming narcissistic, quasi-autistic, and except for potential unconditional consumer adoration of locking the public out. Their function and reason for existence is to be and to establish themselves as an absolute reference, an absence of a public and ultimately an absence of democracy. By encouraging the opening of the work of art to a multiplicity of interpretations, Echo's open work at least proposes some degree of democracy, even if he still maintains the traditional artist-viewer class division. All traditional views concerning the artist accept that thanks to the choice of discipline and craft, he or she is somebody who in one way or another selects, controls, and administers information. Thus the artist is invested with a power the viewer supposedly abrogates or lacks. Making the work of art the locus of this power exempts the artist from any responsibility of sharing it or educating the public to take its own initiative. 
The artist owns the information, emits it in administered dosage, and controls the attention of the receptor. The ideal dumbass piece does not emit information, but like a black hole, absorbs it. If there is any information emitted, it is only as a reflection of information absorbed from the viewer. The viewer emits his or her own energy without receiving anything, anything from the object or situation. There is no exchange, no traces, no documentation of a dialogue between viewer and art object. There is no reward, emotional or hedonistic, except for that produced by the viewer. If there is an experience of sublimity, it is only because the viewer projected it, not due to any creation by the artist. Under these circumstances, authorship becomes something very relative, since the traditional monologue by the artist ceases to exist. The artist offers silence, and if there is any dialogue, it occurs between the viewer and him or herself. If there is any poetry, it is one nourished by the viewer. Art becomes an activator, and consumption becomes meaningless because imagination takes its place. Maybe the biggest difference with minimalism is that here the door remains purposefully open. In Palermo's work, the prototypes series, In Palermo's work, the prototype series impresses me as the most successful and pure in this enterprise. Generally, it is also in his sketches where he comes closer. The stage before the work takes the formal appearance required by gallery presentation. It is in the, that last finishing stage for the gallery, at least in my opinion, where Palermo gets distracted by premises explored by his colleagues. His environmental pieces, though, though highly acclaimed in some quarters, seem less path-breaking and more like appropriations and adaptations of problems that at the time were in the air. Some are, in fact, plain reductionist exercises, like the underlining of freezes or reduction and expansion like the installations that reforms the lines into figures. But in prototypes and some other pieces, like satiricon, like two satiricon, or even for Joseph Boyce Unfinished, his exploration goes into a totally different direction, one where no verbal articulation comes out from the work. The latter, in its visually non-sequential sequence, seems to demand that the left eye goes to the oval while the right one fixes on the red canvas. And the centerpiece, a polished mirror like aluminum, mirror like aluminum rectangle, gets lost in the effort. There is an autobiographic sequence. Palermo left some notes, but inaccessible to those who wouldn't know him. That lack of access is exemplified by the reversed order of the piece in the Magma catalog for his retrospective in Barcelona. The notes are free form, freedom, under the gray disc, mirror, recognition, logic, law, under the mirror, and pure color, transformation, endless possibilities, freedom, question mark, expansion, insight, under the color piece. This boy's piece contains a visual non-order that to the people follows later, and it may be no coincidence that sketches for both projects appear in the same sketchbook. More interesting and original than any other issue in Palermo is the tension between icon and order and the transcending of either. The prototypes exemplify the first, to the people exemplifies the second. Transcendence of the icon is an issue taken up by many meditational images, like, for example, the tantric drawings from Rajasthan that could be seen in New York some years ago. Some formally resemble both BLP and Palermo's discs, 
but I believe Jorge Luis Borges best describes the principle of this in his story, The Aleph. The Aleph is a dot only visible from the stairs leading to a basement. Its owner instructs, you affix your eyes to the 19th step of the pertinent staircase. The point he mentions is really a little sphere of about an inch in diameter and has in, all, in it all the images of the world. By pure coincidence, the owner, Carlo Zanetti, a writer, is somebody who could be cataloged as a voludo in the worst interpretation of the word, a real dickhead. Borges describes him, quote, his mental ability is continuous, passionate, versatile, and totally insignificant. What matters here is that the little ball simultaneously contains all the information of the universe without any leakage or confusion. Any, possible, any possibly declarative quality is canceled by the absence of order or hierarchy. Thus, the informa informa informative aspect becomes completely irrelevant. The hypersaturation of information is equivalent to the deepest silence. The viewer of the Aleph is reduced to a meditative state of complete projection. The iconic approach of the pieces described seems to bypass information and try to reach silence directly through the use of form. But form here is clearly used as a passage and not as an end in itself. The transcendence of order, although using a series of physical objects, seems to address the issue in an even more ethereal manner. Any focus on a single piece, except for some transient hedonic pleasure, actually would derail from the deeper experience in her recent monograph, Christine Marion quotes Bernard Schwenk describing Palermo's cloth paintings. According to Schwenk, Palermo makes us, uh, makes us see wholeness without feeling unity and creates a disturbing fascination. I can do without the cloth paintings. <clears throat> I can do without the cloth paintings. I won't even show them. But the statement is pretty good when applied to the people of New York. Continuing my personal interpretation, I would say that because of our training to produce and acquire objects, we have lost sight of art itself. Historically speaking, the Stone Age artist wanted to favor hunting. The religious artist wanted to replicate sacredness. The realist wanted to reproduce the infinite dots that conform reality. The abstractionist wanted to fix the sensitivity of the world and the political artist intended to raise the consciousness of society. All of them only superficially touched the problems they embarked in without ever solving them. Their material success and social recognition does not really diminish the scale of the failure of their attempts. The dumbass artist probably will suffer the same fate. The ultimate work that doesn't emit anything and only is there to elicit and absorb information is unreachable. It is only a wish. If this extreme would ever be reached, the corresponding art would not be perceivable. It would only be a prompting that dies in its invisibility, regardless of how much enlightenment it might produce. But what is interesting in the attempt is the shift in the measurements of quality and importance it makes. It produces. The degree of craftsmanship and conceptual refinement give room to the administration of declarative information. Dazzling effects are reduced to call just enough attention of the viewer to start a projection process insulated from any interference. It is a daunting task. It requires a sense of form that helps to eliminate form, a conceptualism devoid of concept, and the craftsmanship subtle enough to self-erase to the absolute needed minimum. The parameters of, for reading the work have to be as broad as possible, but calibrated not to go into unacceptable directions. Thus, the artist doesn't really renounce to any rights of conversion. 
the only renunciation is to any ego-serving declarative power. I believe this is a way of measuring art as important as composition might be, or mastery of color and skills and other tools used to estimate quality. It generates questions like, how much room does the artist leave us for our own creation? Is the work a monument to the artist or a stimulus to expand our knowledge? Is the piece declaring or prompting us to declare? These are questions that do not necessarily eliminate old quality standards, but they should be added whenever we confront the work of others. It is in this spirit that I underline and admire the modesty of Palermo's pieces, as well as those of the colleagues I mentioned. They show us the enormous difference that exists between dumb-ass art and dumb-ass artists, a topic our unexpectedly polite history of art has <clears throat> hasn't yet fully addressed. But beyond this, something that might be seen as an aside, that green triangle has it in it. I wonder with great hopes what Palermo's thoughts might have been when he decided to call it prototype. Thank you. Any question? No, we leave. <clears throat> yes. Well, in certain ways, I would be foreclosing myself as well, <laughs> which I may be doing. But um, now that's why I say it's a measuring tool. It's not an ultimate end of art. But it's a measuring tool that should be applied together with other measuring tools. And I actually do apply it both to myself and to Hans. <laughs> And uh, in the following sense, I think a lot of political art, or called political art, I don't like the term, tends to express the political opinions the artist has and doesn't deal with the conversion of the public that you really want. The acid test is really if, am I able to get a very reactionary person and change the beliefs to be as progressive and enlightened as mine, rather than informing that reactionary person that I am progressive and enlightened. And that function of art has been neglected, I think, a lot, especially by people that consider themselves doing political work or being activists through their art. Yes? <laughs> Good. Sure. 
Shall I read it again? <laughs> yes? Idea of what? The idea of well, the word progress, or the idea of progress, and as you mentioned, this kind of, I don't know if you would call it an ideal, but an object that you're able to sort of look through completely and it becomes completely reflected with the, the audience's uh, projections onto it. So then that displaces from the artist being the kind of the maybe the 40 or moral 40 even back to the viewer. But then I guess I'm just sort of curious, you know. It's, it's sort of, it's both kind of asking for a type of regression in some way, a type of, but it's also kind of displacing it. Does this make sense? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> One thing is work in progress, another thing is progress. So I'm not totally clear what you mean. But I think no matter what, any artwork should be perfect. And uh, by, so art in progress seems to be unfinished from the artist's point of view, not necessarily from the viewer's point of view. And uh, so I don't think it's a good concept. I think in the clumsiness of the green triangle, let's call it that way, I think it's a perfect piece. I don't know what Palermo thought about it, but in terms of what I can do with it, I think it's a perfect piece. I don't think the triangle over the door is a perfect piece because it's too perfect, and therefore it's locking me out a little bit, but it's on the way. That triangle, in its roughness, in its... Uh, tentativeness is actually it opens the door exactly to what I want from a piece of art and a perfect triangle would not so I don't know how to put in art in progress there or work in progress or progress progress in itself I it's very debatable as a notion it's too value laden and we would have to discuss that somewhere else. <laughs> it's a public of consumers. <laughs> yes. I think it's connected with spectacle. And uh, a lot of art, especially today, gives primacy to the spectacle rather than to the communication, or um, forces a viewer into being a consumer of the spectacle rather than having an even horizontal dialogue with the uh, artist. And I think a piece of art <clears throat> is not a product. I think a piece of art is a situation or a space in which the artist communicates with the viewer. And ideally, it hasn't happened yet, but ideally the viewer should be able to communicate with the artist. So it's like a chat room. And it doesn't matter what form it takes. It's just that in a market situation, that form 
is what can be traded, and therefore it has its own life that has become the life of the artist but shouldn't have. So the humility is really bringing it back to the chat room level and out of the product. I know you don't like to hear that, but and I guess, <laughs> and, uh, that's the context, I think. So I, unfortunately, uh, Palermo, is, uh, I think because he didn't live long enough, he couldn't solidify his discourse. And I have not a clue in what direction he would have gone. He might have gone into pure spectacle or not. I think the guy was very much uh, aware and eager of the art market and probably would have been influenced. But some of his pieces seem much more authentic. I don't know if he would have hung the pieces like they are in Dia Beacon. And I really don't know, and I didn't check. I'm not a scholar of Palermo. I, I like the Green Triangle, period. <laughs> uh, so uh, unless he left specific instructions, which I don't know, that space, Occup occupation of space in India may be an exaggeration. And somehow I have sympathy for the photographs of the pieces sort of standing against the wall in a studio, which are very unobtrusive and uh, lead you to discovery. And so there's something to be said about that. On the other hand, the way they are hung in India, uh, it makes clearer that the order is fictitious or non-existent and forces you to work on that. So some advantage to that. But I wish that he would have lived a couple, at least a couple of years more and uh, decided in what direction would he go. And that would be crucial for a discussion of his work. As it is, I think uh, we're trying to merge a lot of different directions and experiments into one discourse. And I don't think that is possible. Okay. Seems so. Uh, 